And we're really pleased to be here and pleased to be giving a talk together because, as we're saying, neither of us has given an in-person talk in two and a half, three years. So 20 minutes each seems like a reasonable amount of time to speak loudly. So we'll see how it goes and we'll see how our voices hold. Um, so I'm Katie Shilton. And I'm Megan Finn. Hi, all. Um, and today we're going to talk about a case study that we've been working on within a broader project focused on what we're calling ethics governance in the making, which is a mouthful. And we will explain what we mean by that. Um, and we've had the, an opportunity to present this work before um, to uh, scholars in history of, of uh, technology and science and technology studies, which are the disciplines that we sort of come out of. Um, but we haven't had a chance to do it for this interdisciplinary audience. So we're really excited uh, to have the chance to do that today. Um, but with that said, please ask if there are things you want clarified during the talk. We're sort of working on making it a talk that works in more environments. So uh, please feel free to ask. Um, a little background about us and how we arrived at this project. Um, we both teach policy and ethics courses to students in information studies, uh, library science, HCI. And um, in the course of teaching those classes, we both discovered this thing called the Menlo Report. And the Menlo Report um, ended up being, for us, something that we thought was a really interesting example of ethics self-governance, a field coming together to say, these are going to be ethics rules for our field. Um, and then we asked our like, computer security colleagues about this, and they didn't know what it was. And we thought, oh, that's really interesting. What's happening here? And as social scientists, we wanted to investigate this more. And the reason that we were really interested in investigating this more is because um, you know, we have this perception that uh, you know, ethics self-governance is, is a hot topic in computer science right now. Um, that self-governance, the field of computing, is going through a real moment of wanting to self-govern ethics. Um, and, um, and, you know, Menlo was 10 years ago. But since then, the tenor of the ethics conversation around computer science has really changed and has ramped up in many ways. Um, a range of public examples, plus some really important academic work, have highlighted challenges in data and research ethics, in uh, the development of pervasive tools of surveillance, and in discrimination in decision-making systems and in machine learning systems. So the ethics governance in the making process of the Menlo Report was of real interest to Megan and I, um, as this, within this moment now when computing is, is confronting crises of ethics. Um, and we wanted to know what can current efforts for self-governance learn from this process 10 years ago. OK, so this concept that we're interested in, ethics governance, um, is uh, the idea that these are, there are networks of people, in this case, sort of whole academic fields, that are attempting to resolve uncertainty about um, what is the right or wrong thing to do through new rules, new procedures, or new consequences, and sometimes all three. Um, and those kinds of efforts are happening like right on this campus, as well as in research communities that both Megan and I are part of. So for instance, Stanford's Ethics and Society Review Board engages researchers um, in uh, early phases of AI research through uh, procedures that consider the societal risks of that research. And they attach funding consequences to those decisions. That's the consequences part. Megan was the author recently of the National, Ac uh, National Academies report that offered best practices for funding agencies, for academic organizations, and for individual researchers concerned with responsible computing. I was the former chair of the SIGCHI um, Research Ethics Committee, which is a volunteer group that offers advice when papers in SIGCHI conferences are flagged by reviewers for having ethics issues. So these are all current examples of uh, ethics self-governance projects. Uh, but there are numerous historical examples as well. Uh, perhaps among the most famous is the Asilomar Conference on Recombinant DNA, which was a 1975 meeting um, of, uh, to set voluntary guidelines for the use of uh, recombinant DNA in research. And then many of you, if you've done human subjects training at your university, may be familiar with the Belmont Report, which was a 1976 um, effort to identify ethical principles for human subjects research. And then, of course, there's Menlo, um, which would become the subject of our case study. Menlo took place um, almost a decade, as I said before, the wave of recent controversies. And uh, starting in 2009, a group of computer scientists primarily, as well as lawyers and government security uh, 
and network measurement research folks culminated, um, got together and put together uh, guidelines for computer security and network measurement research. Um, and that culminated in this 2012 report. And so the recent history, the fact that you know, all those folks are still active researchers, they're still around, like we could talk to them, gave us the opportunity to explore how is this work done, uh, what are the ingredients in self-governance efforts, and then how do those ingredients matter to the outcomes and the impacts of the project? So Megan and I, as I mentioned before, both have roots in science and technology studies. Um, and we began framing our interests in ethics governance and ethics self-governance in that literature. So we drew on the idea of constitutional moments, which are times when a field or a group of people are renegotiating the terms of unethical and ethical practice. So that's what's happening is there's a constitutional moment. And then we were really interested in an idea called ethics work or the idea of ethics work, which is Malta Zewitz's term for when people have to do work in their like labs and workplaces to cope with ethical ambiguity. So when you don't know what to do, you maybe talk about it with people in your workplace, uh, you're doing work, right? That's ethics work. And we're interested in kind of on the other end of the spectrum from ethics work, ethics governance, drawing on Rebecca Slayton's definition of governance as networks trying to steer people in a particular direction by either accepting members into the network or cutting members that don't go in the direction that they are wanting to go. So the contrast between ethics work on the one hand, sort of local uh, ambiguity resolving, and ethics governance, cutting people from networks um, if necessary, on the other, led us to a set of research questions that are focused on how localized ethics work becomes ethics government, governance on a bigger scale. Um, when we call this bridge ethics governance in the making, it's a mouthful term, but it was the best we could come up with. You have better terms. You <laughs> yeah. So our research questions became, what sparks a group of people to do the really resource intensive work, and you'll see, and it was really resource intensive, of imagining new governance for a field? Um, what challenges does governance in the making present? What's hard about it? And how does the work of envisioning new governance influence what becomes seen as ethical action and guidance for the field? So the Menlo Report gave us the chance to answer these questions for a single case study. Localized ethics work has been occurring in the computer security and network measurement um, fields for decades. Um, the computer security research community has long debated ethical questions like uh, the acceptability of monitoring network traffic, uh, the political consequences of e-voting, um, and principles for handle, handling vulnerability disclosures. There's lots of localized ethics work happening in computer security. Um, and so our project began with the question of how and why that those localized debates became this governance effort. And so producing the Menlo Report was really an effort to move from reliance upon tacit norms within labs to an agreed upon standard. <laughs> and we analyzed the Menlo Report documents, um, which included uh, both uh, the Menlo Report itself as well as a companion piece that had case studies in it. Um, we also analyzed several articles about the report that were written by report authors at the time. Um, and then um, we uh, talked to authors. So in the final list of authors, six of the authors were active computer science researchers um, in either academia or technical research institutes. Uh, four were working as lawyers or law scholars. Two were employed by the Department of Homeland Security who funded the, the effort, and we're gonna talk more about that in a minute. Um, and two were working for, uh, in research protection within a research organization. That means they were sort of IRB-ish, if you know about IRBs. Um, so we conducted interviews with 11 of these 15 authors, everybody who would talk to us, um, and discussed the work of, with them of creating the report, how participants became involved, um, how the writing and collaboration process was organized and funded, uh, and the legacy and influence of the report. And we also analyzed um, separately, ethics statements in papers published within network security and network measurement conferences in the years after the report. So the report itself, um, interestingly, builds on core principles that were articulated in the 1979 Belmont Report. Um, and that's the report that shaped human subjects research standards in the social sciences um, in the US. And so Menlo adopted uh, the three core principles of uh, Belmont. 
respect, beneficence, and justice. They laid those out as equally important to computing research. Um, so, and in that move, made a move where they said, Menlo said that, that they basically declared that computing data was human subjects data and would be subject to these principles. Um, and in addition, Menlo added a fourth principle, uh, respect for law and public interest. And we're gonna trace how that fourth principle came out of major debates that were happening in the field at the time. So through our analysis, what we found was that even in this case study of technologists who were pretty self-consciously crafting new ethics principles, that's what they came together to do, um, they was, it was really a process of what we call an STS bricolage, which means bringing <laughs> together what's available at hand, bringing together available tools at hand. This was not, this was way more prominent, this sort of bringing together of existing tools than say, moral reasoning from first principles. Um, we kind of thought that, that the process would be one of, well, I think we think of ethics as, as logical reflection and, and then coming up with principles that you know, come from, from, from first, um, first standards, first principles. But it turns out that crafting ethical principles is work too, like any other work, like work in a lab, like work in a workplace. Um, and that bringing together and adapting existing materials, the stuff that you know about, turns out to be really important. So as research communities in AI ethics and other um, controversies in our spaces now begin their work of governance in the making, I think it's going to be, it's going to be really necessary to decide who participates, to decide um, what, uh, what things we have at hand, right? What principles are we going to bring to these projects? And a framework for how to study how that happens, ethics in the making, governance in the making, can help us understand uh, these efforts better and maybe be more reflective about how we set them up in the first place. So we suggest, based on Menlo, a framework that incorporates five elements of work. Um, and we're going to walk through some of them today. The first is marshalling the resources that are available. All of this is time and money, so thinking about the resources available really matters to the outcomes. Um, background, uh, or the second is the attempts to repair what is a group trying to repair? What wrongs have gone on that have brought a group together to try and fix those wrongs? Third is attempts to anticipate the future. So we'll talk about how Menlo participants were trying to deal with a future that they couldn't see coming. Um, and particularly changes in technologies because that changes quickly. Uh, uh, next was work to close or settle existing controversies in the field. So to try and make some decisions about Yes, this is okay. No, this is not okay. Um, and finally, to resolve ethical uncertainties as participants try to understand what practices are acceptable. So because ethics in the making is this bricolage process, um, we see this list of five things as not total, you know, it's not uh, necessary, but not sufficient, right? It's not totally generalizable. Things will be different in different places. But we do think it's helpful to understand the process um, involved in what gets put into ethics governance. So today we're going to focus on one, two, and four, uh, but we can also talk about three and five if you are interested um, in uh, um, you know, more details in the Q&A. OK. So first we looked at the resources that were marshaled for the Menlo project. And first among these resources were the people involved. It was the primary resource involved were people whose background and expertise impacted the resulting guidance. Um, for Menlo, the actors involved and the resources involved um, influenced the content of the report, and they also, as I'll talk about, influenced how successfully the report was able to govern. Menlo was bootstrapped. <laughs> it was bootstrapped uh, through uh, a US Department of Homeland Security existing program called PREDICT. PREDICT standed for, or uh, st stood, <laughs> stood for, Protected Repository for the Defense of Infrastructure Against Cyber Threats. It was kind of a backward. <laughs> <laughs> um, but PREDICT is what they were trying to do, right? Predicting threats, essentially. Um, and one of the many things, PREDICT was a big program, big funding program for academics. Uh, but one of the big things they sought to do was to enable data sharing uh, between academics about online networks so that you would have a place you could go to get, say, ISP data if you needed ISP data. So they wanted to do data sharing. Um, and as part of their interest in data sharing, they started to run up against ethical issues like privacy and things <laughs> like that, where if you're sharing data, you might, you might need to worry about. So PREDICT, the existence of PREDICT enabled Menlo 
almost entirely. Um, and then it, that enabling happened in a variety of ways. Writing workshops were connected to predict PI meetings. Um, so that meant they generally occurred a day before or a day after a PI meeting. PI meetings are times when researchers are required by their funders to show up and be there mm -hmm. and report out. And so what this meant is there were a bunch of people funded on Predict who also became involved with Menlo because it was pretty accessible for them to be involved with Menlo. Um, and uh, it, made it, yeah, it made it easier for all these network security uh, folks to attend. Um, and so the co-location strongly shaped participation within the project. Uh, the people who participated in the report were primarily academic computer scientists and were largely from the network measurement and network security subfields of computer science. So it was not really computer science at large, it was a pretty specific subset. Um, and then these researchers were joined by a handful of people who were recruited by predict organizers, uh, primarily lawyers with expertise in cybersecurity law. And so we think it's also important to consider who wasn't uh, at Menlo meetings. So traditionally, um, ethicists and social scientists have been part of big self-governance efforts in various places. Um, for instance, Asilomar, Belmont. Um, and they were absent from Menlo proceedings. Um, and an author you know, described to us, we reached out to a number of people in the ethics community who go way back, well-known names. I won't say the names. <laughs> we tried to involve some of them. There weren't a whole lot of takers, partially because it was a volunteer effort, I think but also partially because it was leaving the area that they have expertise in. That's my gut feeling. So without ethicists on the team, the team lacked expertise to question the coherency or appropriateness of those Belmont mod principles to proceed from perhaps concrete and uh, concrete ethical frameworks. That bricolage work we think is a result of who was in the room, right? Uh, they, they were not philosophers to start from first principles. Um, and uh, you know, it was hard to invent new forms of ethical reflection that might have been a better fit for computer security without folks trained to do that. Um, and the authors acknowledged this limitation, right? Like they were really frank about this. In the introduction to the report, they wrote, the report deliberately does not explore alternate ethical paradigms to Belmont. And while not discounting that there may be novel implementations of the Belmont report principles and applications that should be considered, it makes no def definitive recommendations in that regard, right? This was a fight. Should we do something beyond Belmont? They said, okay, we're, we're, not, gonna, we're not gonna go there. Um, and there's another a further limitation, a few further limitations to this group that I think are worth talking about. Um, without social scientists, the team couldn't incorporate expertise on sociality, on inequality, work practices, institutional dynamics, none of that really showed up in the discussions around the report, um, that might have supported the implementation of governance networks, right? You can make recommendations. Social scientists might have been helpful in figuring out how to govern um, or how to get the governance frameworks working. Um, so that's not there. And finally, the authorship group uh, reflected the lack of racial and ethnic diversity within computer science at the time um, and, and now, um, limiting the standpoints that were incorporated into the final recommendations. So after the Menlo report was written, uh, they still needed resources to circulate the report, to engage the envisioned governance networks, um, such as program committees or institutional review boards, the, the groups that they thought would help implement this. And Menlo's transition from in the making to actualized governance was really challenged by both logistics and resources. As a first step, the team took a path that had been modeled by Belmont, but was pretty unusual for computer science codes of ethics. They published the Menlo report in the Federal Register, which is the official channel for sharing and requesting public feedback on US government agency rules. Um, so the public, change for the, the public chance for comment had some advantages. Um, it differentiated Menlo from many science and technology self-governance projects, which had been critiqued for a lack of public participation. Um, this was a channel for public participation. Um, they didn't, you know, public representatives weren't part of writing, but they did have a chance to comment. Uh, but even government employees among the report authors acknowledged the limitations of the Federal Register as a dissemination approach. As an author told us, even still, it's only people who follow Washington that actually know what the Federal Register really is. Um, the Menlo Report was uh, first published online in December 2011 and it received 16 public comments, so not a, not a ton. Um, so though the process of publishing Menlo in the Federal Register was the start of a process for federal agency rulemaking, 
Ultimately, the Department of Homeland Security did not complete the rulemaking process. Uh, Menlo is not part of any regulations <laughs> at the government level now. Um, as what a researcher who later became an employee at the Department of Homeland Security told us, someone should have led the process with rulemaking. We, sh we, would, we should have tried to do that lift, but it would have been a really heavy lift. So it didn't happen. So sharing the report in the Federal Register signaled that Menlo authors intended to recruit powerful existing regulation networks for governance. But Menlo's recommendations were never formally adopted by government agencies. So instead, Menlo's primary influence on the field was through academic networks of peer review. Conference committees became uh, the ones to effectively steer the ethics of security and network measurement research by cutting or refusing to publish research that didn't adhere, uh, adhere to Menlo recommendations. As an author recounted, it's about changing norms. You don't see it right away. And now I can point to top security conferences that require ethical statements. I consider this a clear victory. So though Menlo, as we studied it, was governance in the making, we do think it helped move the field of network measurement and computer security into a mode of ethics governance. After the report was published, one of the highest status conferences in the computer security field, USENICS, included the following requirement in their call for papers in 2013. Papers that describe experiments on human subjects or that analyze non-public data derived from human subjects, even anonymized data, should disclose whether an ethics review for example, IRB approval, was conducted and discussed steps taken to ensure that participants were treated ethically. Other major network uh, uh, security, computer security and network management conferences soon followed. And we tracked how many papers were talking about ethics and IRB in the years after the publication of the Menlo report and the introduction of the requirement to discuss research ethics. In some cases, the addition of such a requirement doubled the number of accepted papers discussing ethics and or review board approval. And in 2019, the Internet Measurement Conference, which is a major conference in network measurement, explicitly included links to the Menlo report in the call for papers. So we don't want to argue that Menlo caused this effect of uh, conferences deciding. We don't have the evidence that that was the case. But it coincided, Menlo coincided with governance uh, changes in the field that were associated with, most associated with the author groups. And the authors of Menlo went out to be on these program committees in, in some cases. Um, so this was a change that was happening in the field at the time. So I'm gonna hand off to Megan now to talk about the next process that we discovered. All right, let me pause. Are there questions? You guys are so quiet, um, which is great. Katie and I both <laughs> obviously love to talk, um, <laughs> but please, please interrupt us or interrupt me if you have any questions. Um, oh, Michael has a question. question. Yes. Um, this shift, did it coincide with the shift in the topics published in the conference? Like, were, were people doing more research that might have human subjects? Yeah, or, or was it already happening and now they were just actually referencing? So we've collected this data at like a fairly shallow level and are in the process <laughs> of analyzing it across this. And we actually collected data from a couple of other conferences. Um, so I can't answer that. Yeah, it's a great <laughs> it's question. It's a great question. And, um, it's an analysis we yeah, to apply, yeah, which yeah. we will. <laughs> One that we definitely will think about. Any other? Yeah. Is there any, has there been any personal statements from people involved in these conferences that they're aware of this report and it changed maybe it was in the discussions when they changed the policy or anything like that? Yeah, that's a great. Um, so we also haven't done those interviews, but that sounds like great data to collect. I'll say that um, our participants were also um, in program committees. They were also program chairs. Um, and we've collected some data about how the Memo Report authorship group um, became or didn't become um, sort of visible members of these different conference communities. The data that's also much more interesting is, right, like who's doing reviewing. And um, to the extent that people are doing reviewing and they're sending stuff back and saying that it's not ethical, that has been data I know that Katie's actually formally tried to collect, and it's near impossible to get a hold of. We hear about it anecdotally through interviews that we do. People will say, like, oh, yeah, we, and some of that shows up in this data. Some of it shows up in um, another interview set that we have. But people will say, yeah, you know, I read this paper. It made me really uncomfortable. I didn't know if it was ethical. I sent it back to the PC. But they don't necessarily even know as reviewers, right, than what the PC does with it. Um, Great question. Others? Okay. Oh, yeah. 
you say, uh, do you know why the USENIX conference seemed to adopt uh, the memo report or uh, this kind of requirement of uh, ethical disclosure earlier? And then secondly, looking at the CCS conference, it looked like it was all, there, there, there was a jump in disclosures yeah. before the adoption? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a great question. So the second question, if I had to make a guess, um, my understanding is that publication practices in computer science are often such that if your paper doesn't get into one conference, you might reuse it in another conference with like a later, I know. <gasps> but maybe with an ethics statement on it, yeah, right? And the so next time. maybe that's some of the reason, right? Is somebody wrote a paper for a Usenix conference, it didn't get in, they revised it, but they kept in some of that ethics disclosure language um, in a difference conference. So that would be, that's a total hypothesis, have not looked into it yet. Um, again, probably not data that we can actually even get, although yeah. we could go although, I mean, and con to contact Michael's, those authors. To Michael's question that I think is a really good one is, you know, how much of this is menlo -y reverberations mm. and how much of this topic change where people right. all of a sudden are doing human subject research? Because the other thing that's changing at this time, and, and we talk about this in, from our Menlo authors, is that um, network data went from being something that mm -hmm. few people had to something that everybody's got, right? right. Like you could you can get your whole university's network and, and track it. Maybe you shouldn't or, you know, and so all of the Menlo authors are, are struggling with this and the field is struggling with this. So it's possible that some, especially these early pre-Menlo um, sort of bumps are, um, are about, you know, people having new controversial methods and, and responding to it with ethics work, right? Within labs saying, okay, and yeah, we thought about this, right? <laughs> And then the question around why Usenix first. Um, so actually like Internet Measurement Conference and the first um, conference that we know of in this sort of broader field of network measurement and security to adopt this requirement is actually a SOUPS, which I don't know what that acronym stands for, but my uh, understanding is that that's the HCI Meets Security Conference. Symposium, on Symposium yeah. Privacy Yes, Symposium on Usable Privacy and Security. Nice job. Thank you, Michael. The on um, is important there. <laughs> yeah, so they adopt uh, requirements in 2009, and I think that that's a lot because they're involved with the HCI community and the security community. And so, and I, I've actually had some conversations with people who were sort of in the room when they adopted that requirement. And they said it was basically this issue where people in HCI were like, of course, if there's human subjects, you're talking about it in your paper. But that wasn't actually clear to the security researchers. So part of putting that requirement in was actually just articulating assumptions that one research community held close and you know, sort of assumed everybody understood, but another research community really didn't. Um, and so another guess about why Usenix first is it might also be that Usenix had more of a presence of HCI researchers and sort of like anecdotally, Katie and I might guess that, but I have no, that's that's totally a guess on our part. Really great questions, you guys, yeah, thank you. We have a good history to trace. Okay, I'm gonna jump back into it then. Um, okay, so moving back to our discussion about what it means to do ethics governance in the making. Um, our second sort of pillar here is we found that ethics governance attempts to repair the wrongs of the past in anticipation for guiding the future. So one of the things that really motivated researchers when we went and asked them, why did you volunteer your efforts, all of this precious time that you have to write this report, was that they were really concerned that there were papers in their field that had been published and that these publications were communicating to other people in this, the field, particularly their students, um, that there were research methods that were acceptable that they did not think were acceptable. Um, so we use this term repair to talk about this effort to sort of go back, look at the past, and fix it. Um, and we're borrowing this repair language from, from our field, science and technology studies. I just want to note we don't mean it in repair in the sense of like giving restitution, right? Um, it means that they're very much looking, the memo authors are looking at specific publications, they're attempting to identify their weaknesses, and they're producing guidance that they think attends to these weaknesses. Um, okay, so repair is also really str strongly tied with this ide idea of anticipation, as you've guessed from probably what I've said so far. Um, it means that the report in this sense is both simultaneously looking to the past, like what we did wrong, and looking to the future, what can we do better? 
Um, and you know, noting the gender pronouns that our interview select, interviewees selected here, um, this quote kind of perfectly encapsulates that forward and backward look, the idea that it's trying to anticipate the future and fix these problems of the past. Others were looking at ethically questionable work um, and he was publishing papers and they were saying, wow, if he did it, we can do this, right? This was the, this was the problematic publication record that they had to attend to to move forward into the future. Um, <clears throat> so our interviews were interested in, prepare, in repairing the past research record, but they also explained to us that they weren't at this same level of public urgency in which, say, like the Belmont Report was being written. Um, and there's this concept in public policy and political science that they talk about quote unquote, focusing events. And these are events that are catalysts for like major policy changes. Um, they're like the revelations around the Tuskegee experiments that led to the Belmont Report are like a perfect example of a quote unquote focusing event. And importantly, Menlo is really not one of these situations. Um, our, our author said, we are not infecting people with syphilis. We're not doing a Milgram experiment that's going to necessarily scar someone emotionally. There's a removal, a distance between the human beings and the researcher. It was not felt that it was quite as visceral of a thing. And so the Belmont Report really, as you can tell, loomed very large as this paradigmatic example of ethics regulation. But our participants felt that there wasn't a lot of public attention to computing ethics at this time, right? This, it, this is sort of in the mid 2000s. Um, they're very aware of these sort of utopian imaginaries, the sort of savior ideals, um, discourses that are circulating in the early 2000s when this project uh, originated, right? The so-called tech clash is really a decade away. Okay, but not having focusing events didn't mean that there weren't problems in the field. There wasn't a Tuskegee experiment, but there were a lot of controversial papers that were troubling to many researchers and many funders. And part of the Menlo Report companion document, which was published uh, about a year after the Menlo Report, included a list of papers in one of the appendices that were presented as case studies, um, but could really be read as sort of like a naming names. Um, that these were, the, you know, these were sort of um, the notable papers that when we asked uh, our interviewees, why did you work on this project? These were the papers that they were pointing to. They, they read one of these papers and they thought, uh-oh, like this isn't good for our field. Um, it wasn't the Tuskegee experiments, right? But it was really, really worrying to our participants. So I'm gonna talk about one of these papers which was published in 2007 as a way of discussing one example of what the Menlo authors were reacting to um, when they started the project and sort of illustrate this idea of what we call like an atmosphere of concern and measurement in security research at that time. And this example also helps explain um, a bit about why this sort of ethics self-governance project took the specific shape that it did, right? As opposed to the sort of many other different approaches to dealing with these kinds of um, to de dealing with these kinds of problems. So broadly, many of the concerning papers in this list um, in the Menlo Companion document were really fundamentally about information flows, like who gets to see what, how, and in what circumstances. And as Katie said earlier, information sharing was really core to this project of PREDICT program. Um, researchers were trying to understand the characteristics of the internet and its weaknesses and working on the, challenging, um, the challenges that they saw um, in preparing network data for sharing. Uh, but getting network data was not easy. It required networks of administrators that, that they would share data and trusted researchers that they were sharing the data with, right? Compromised data could affect the security of the network. And this paper um, that I'm gonna talk about is called Playing the Devil's Advocate. It specifically addresses this problem. Okay, so what is this problematic paper, um, The Devil's <coughs> Advocate, about? It was published in 2007. Um, the paper is a play on a title of a 2006 paper called The Devil uh, and Packet Trace Anonymization. 
And the authors of this original paper, the Devil and Packet Trace Anonymization paper, presented a method for anonymizing network data, network data that the researchers had received from Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. And the anonymized data set was shared with the authors of Playing the Devil's Advocate, who both de-anonymized the data and then shared the details about the de-anonymized data set. And as the Menlo authors explain, the authors applied uh, their de-anonymization de-anonym- techniques to a publicly as- accessible data set prominently used in the security community. To prove the correctness of their result, they published key information about the public data set in their paper, thus revealing the internals about that researcher's network. De-anonymizing network data and revealing networked in- um, network information was experienced as a severe violation of the research community norms by the authors of the original paper um, and others in the community. And the authors of the Devil um, and Packet Trace Anonymization, Allman and Paxton, um, had not expected that their colleagues would de-anonymize the shared data and share these details, right? So they published a rebuke that is very politely called, titled, Issues and Etiquette Concerning Use of Shared Measurement Data. And the authors emphasize that no matter how careful a network administrator was being, that they were always sharing more information than they thought. And they reasoned that technology could not solve many of the issues around data sharing ethics. And they said, ultimately, the choice about what to release, how to obscure the data, and whom to release the data are policy decisions. Um, emphasizing that better policies and norms needed to be established around sharing research data. They put forth their suggestions for what kind of policies would really be best for mediating the sharing um, uh, data sharing relationships by spelling out acceptable uses of the data. And problematic papers, such as playing the devil's advocate, really, in this sense, contributed to this atmosphere of concern that then opened up this idea of policies, of guidelines, of rules, and even ethics as one of the um, possible modes of addressing unethical scholarship. And at the very same session in which Allman and Paxton were talking about this issues and etiquette paper at this major conference, legal scholar Paul Ohm is presenting a paper that he co-authored with two University of Colorado computer scientists um, Doug Stickler and Dirk Grunwald, which examined how US legislation applied to network measurement researchers. And it explained legal issues went beyond data sharing norms to the legality of the data collected. And they're talking about the Federal Wiretap Act, the Pen Register Track and Trace Act. And they suggested that computer scientists were possibly engaged in illegal activities. And the authors offered a number of suggestions which moved from repair to anticipation to improve the likelihood of following the law. And they conclude that at the very least, we should proceed informally by beginning to have a conversation about what constitutes acceptable network monitoring. A codified understanding that reflects even rough consensus would be a useful tool to bring to Congress or to show courts. It is important that these norms and rules are agreed upon from within our community rather than dictated to us by some outside court or agency. In order to repair the problematic research records, scholars were arguing for the needs of something like the Menlo Report to be created, right? And importantly, they argued that it should be created by the research community itself. And so for many of the authors, the Menlo Report was exactly what Ohm and his colleagues were advocating for. It's this clear set of guidelines that was in the Federal Register and could be hauled before Congress. Okay, stepping back to our framework. Um, So our our third bucket is this idea of anticipating future change, which I've also already briefly touched on. Um, Menlo authors anticipated future research methods and attempted to create guidelines to address these future research methods. Um, They also anticipated who might read the document, possible resistances to it, and what the imagined audience of the report might do. And they crafted the report for this imagined audience. Um, As Katie said, we're not going to talk about this one in quite as much detail, so we can move on. I'm going to pause again and ask for questions. Any questions? Yes. I'm just curious, when you were talking about sort of how the authors of this paper were not, you know, it was not a crisis for them. Yeah. Um, and kind of a lot of the examples you were using, most of these kind of fundamental reports were out of the crisis moment. 
Is there any research around kind of, I mean, for example, I'm not super familiar with previous research before the Bell Report on human subjects. Yeah. Is there any research into like, is it necessary to have that crisis moment? Like, if a report is made before that crisis moment, does that just reduce the efficacy because people don't understand the, the need for it yet? I'm just curious like, if there's anything out there about that. Um, so I, let's see. So I also work a lot in the field of disaster studies. And so focusing moments are like a huge deal because oftentimes there'll be like some kind of regulation or um, policy change that particularly like scientific experts might have been advocating for or engineers um, have been advocating for for years behind closed doors. And sometimes it takes one of these like major disasters and then suddenly people are like, I guess we do want anti-seismic building codes, right? Um, and so, you know, you have these sort of people who are standing in the wings saying like, and here it is, right? Um, so in the, in the sense of disasters, yes. I think Katie and I kind of are like, we're in this interesting, I think, constitutional moment in computing ethics right now. And I don't know if you all saw there was um, a sort of call for uh, AI ethics ideas by the office OSTP um, and the the heads the heads of the office for o, um, Office of Science and Technology Policy. Um, so I think it, it sort of looks like maybe we've we've been sort of in some kind of crisis, but it's um, yeah. But I don't know, and I think Katie and I are hoping to tackle this actually in our next research project um, about whether there are like these sort of particular inflection moments where these kinds of um, policy and or sort of ethics responses are particularly effective and are taken up um, en masse. Yeah. It's a very yeah. good question. It's literally like sort of the work of our, yeah, our next couple question. of years. <laughs> and basically how, how big a crisis is a crisis, right? And it's pretty clear yeah. in disaster studies and it's much less clear in computing, right? right? Like what constitute our some racist algorithms, a crisis, maybe, right? But like, uh, but like, I, you know, it's not an earthquake, right? So then this like, yes, I think it's a really good question. But what was clear from Menlo is that a few controversial papers were not a crisis, but they were worried there might be one, right? Um, and so yes, is that the effective moment or do we need to wait for the disaster? I, yeah, it's a great empirical question. Right? Yeah, and I think it's a little bit more complicated because the racist algorithms have existed for several yeah, right. decades <laughs> without being identified as a crisis. And in the last, say, like five to 10 years, a number of excellent scholars and activists have said, this is a crisis. Yeah. Um, but the public attention turning towards, um, hey, let's do something about that has not been the kind of whiplash of an earthquake. Um, nonetheless, I think you know everyone would argue, yes, this is a crisis, or hopefully <laughs> um, in this class you'd argue that this is a crisis, um, but it doesn't have that sort of like immediacy um, that maybe, right, like an earthquake might have. Um, yeah. Clarify a piece that I didn't quite get from yeah. what you're talking about the devil's advocate paper. Was the was the ethical concern with the topics that they were exploring, or was it with the methods that they were publishing? Like they should have redacted certain things in the in the in their research. Um, my understanding was that it was the this the latter um, that it was the methods, um, and that there were details shared, like through sharing these de-anonymization de techniques of the network data set, they shared details about that network that were inappropriate. So I think it was like sharing sharing the entire method, if that makes sense. Um, I think that also occurred around the same time as, I don't know if you all remember, uh, I'm going to guess no, uh, Netflix at one point released this really big data set of Netflix data. And I think it's kind of, it's like a kind of paradigmatic example in a lot of ethics classes of like Netflix released this data, said help us improve our algorithm, and a bunch of like clever computer scientists said we can sort of figure out who's who in this data set, right? Um, yeah, it was, and the other piece of it was that the data sharing agreement, you know, the data had been shared in de-identified form, the researchers felt that they didn't understand that this group was going to re-identify right. the data, and right. so that was it was a like a, a disagree like a disagreement amongst colleagues almost that blew up into like, is this ever okay to do? Yeah.
<laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to step quickly through this number four. Um, so. As Katie noted, one of the major accomplishments of the Menlo report was this explicit identification of computer research as involving human subjects research. And the authors of the Menlo report believed that their um, colleagues, for the most part, um, were trustworthy stewards of data, but they were concerned that sometimes their colleagues didn't understand the fact that they were um, working with data about people. Um, so they really wanted to sort of shore that up and make that very clear in the report. Um, and, but by bringing in, so they did this by bringing in the, uh, the Belmont principles, which they were very attracted to because they're simple. Um, they had this huge impact on, on policy and they've been very durable, right? There aren't a lot of ethics principles that have been really useful for decades and decades and decades. Uh, I shouldn't say that. There aren't a lot of <laughs> ethics principles that have been turned into policies that have been useful for decades upon decades. Um, but in bringing in the Belmont Report and the paradigm of human subjects, it was like this really uncomfortable fit. Um, as this quote from the Menlo Report illustrates, they sort of say, traditional biomedical and behavioral research requires this protection of natural persons. Um, but within ICT research, right, um, it may be an information system, um, uh, associated data, and it complicates the assessment of potential harm of users to that system and that data. It's a lot more ambiguous. It's not as clear of a fit. And so with the application of the human subjects, data associating um, network data with human subjects. It enabled a really clear way forward for the authorship group. Um, but it also codified a set of governance mechanisms, which is IRB review, which was not as easy of a way forward for this group. And so this caused controversy. This wasn't without controversy within the group. So on one hand, you had people who said, you know, when we began at Menlo, there was a diversity of opinions about the applicability of Belmont to the network security research. And there was always someone who would stand up and say, well, we're not working with humans, we're just working with bites. And I suppose one can say, well, I'm not working on humans, I'm just working with blood samples. I think the argument is about as strong in both cases. And then on the other hand, there were, there were participants who said, you know, this, we, we don't want everything to be reviewed by IRBs. This is going to create this huge bureaucratic structure for our organization. And this led to some really new uncertainties um, that the Menlo Report introduced. So they said, in some cases, IRBs didn't know the law, um, and researchers would go and do things that were kind of in a gray area or might have actually broken the law, and the IRB approved it because the IRBs did not necessarily have the expertise in some kinds of um, network security, network insecurity computing research. Furthermore, and again, this is kind of getting back to some of the issues I was pointing out earlier, um, the potential harm of, to subjects in computer security research is much more abstract, as are the benefits. You don't really know how an individual person might benefit to consenting to research or what impacts there might be in waiving consent for monitoring network traffic or just relying on consent um, that's in the terms of service that you click through. So it introduced all of these new uncertainties to the research as well. Okay, fifth, we found that ethics governance attempted to close or settle controversies. So as I noted earlier, there were some really big controversies around not only whether scholarship was unethical, but also whether it was illegal. And so to resolve those controversies around legal practices, the memo report went a step further than Belmont, and they added this fourth principle of respect for research, um, sorry, respect for the law and public interest. But as we all know, the law and public interest are not always the same thing, right? These sometimes compete with each other. Um, and so this, this sort of addition of this principle, it, it really was this um, compromise amongst these different groups of researchers, some of whom felt the law as it was was sufficient enough um, to ensure ethical research practice, and others who, who definitely did not feel that way. So despite appearing in the Federal Register, the Menlo Report ultimately governed by this partial community consensus rather than by 
law. Um, and controversies of both ethics and law and how they apply, they still plague this broader research scientist community. Okay, so we have these five overlapping processes that we argue are constitutive of ethics governance in the making. And as our discussion today hopefully makes clear, we also wanted to add the sixth one, which is that the memo report now becomes this static document, this, research, this resource that's out in the world that other people can draw on and use, but that in the process of sort of laying all of this work down in the document, they also created new uncertainties, they created um, new controversies, and they created you know, this new resource for everybody to make use of. Okay, so as we've been talking about, computer science is definitely in this area of really interesting experimentation with ethics governance in the making across a number of different fields now. Um, researchers and activists are undertaking really interesting projects um, to revise ethics codes, write new ethics guidance, form new committees within computer science conferences and professional associations. Um, and to dictate ethics requirements for funding and propose new ethics requirements for publication. And so we're starting a new project. We would love ideas if you guys have um, sort of examples of field sites that we should look at. Um, we're looking both contemporarily and historically. And our ongoing project, we hope, is gonna document the efficacy of historical, current, and emergence ethics governance in computer science. Um, you guys, thank you for your time. And thank you for all of the great questions. We have time for, I'm really sorry, we meant to have time for 15 minutes of questions, but you have so many good ones in the middle. We have time for three questions, three minutes of questions. So maybe, can I just get all the hands and then we'll try to take them all and answer them quickly? Yeah. Fifth point talking about law, it seems like there's kind of this conflict between very US centric, like participants and having Homeland Security involved, but also trying to set standards for a discipline that transcends the United States. So I was wondering if the participants talked about that in the interviews at all. Great question. Any other questions you guys want us to take? Um, so again, we have we have interviews from sort of like a broader set of folks, and that is definitely a concern outside of the US, um, is like, hey, we don't have IRBs in our country, and you're asking us to you know, um, report as though in our papers, to write as though we have the option of consulting an IRB about human subjects, and we don't. Um, and so one of the things actually in the National Academies report that we suggested was that um, professional associations maybe develop some of these um, institutional resources for folks who maybe don't have access to that at their home institution. And you know, we don't specifically talk about IRB resources per se, um, but something like, stand, like what your professor has been working on, this amazing um, ethics review board um, here at Stanford, um, is something that Stanford has the resources to do, but many universities in the United States may not. Um, and so maybe professional associations are one place in which you can develop that kind of resource that could be used throughout the community. It's a great question. Yeah. Um, so I study, first of all, thank you so much for your presentation. I study programming practices and their value implications on how work happens and what technologies ultimately get built. Um, I'm curious to know uh, if the technologists and computer scientists who you talked to reflected on the connection between the values um, that usually programmers have to wrestle with at the time software is written and the values of the technologies that get built ultimately. Do you want to take that up? Like yeah, yeah. So this is one. a question that I'm <laughs> super, super interested in, and one that I've um, spent a lot of time thinking about. And I would say, it, for in at Menlo, the Men, the Menlo group, no. Does that seem reasonable to you? Yeah, no. That would not be how they frame it. And partially because of this sort of repair work that they were doing, um, it was really you know they were focused on. Uh, their methods as a field. So this actually, and one thing I think we should we should say about Menlo is Menlo is not about how to develop new technologies particularly. It is a set of research practice um, uh, recommendations. And so they were talking about methods and methods in their field, which of course have technical innovation in them, um, but that was really the focus. Of, and so the focus was not on the values 
of computer security, the ways those values are then instantiated in new designs. That is um, a dialogue that was starting to happen at the same time within HCI, um, and but doesn't merge with computer security at this particular Menlo moment. Um, and so it's a great question. Um, it was It's not how I would characterize the Menlo dialogue. You see much more of that now, right? Like it's a very common way of talking about technologies now that has changed since Menlo. Katie and Dan Green have a really great paper that looks at this question around app developers thinking about privacy, um, but I don't remember what the paper is called. Do you? Oh gosh, yes, uh, <laughs> not off the top of my head. Okay, yeah. uh, but if you, yeah, it's uh... yeah, email her. <laughs> yes, but that that sort of values debate does happen in technical communities, but it's much more on the on the build side, yeah. right? Like when people are building technologies, um, this was about governing research practices and data sharing practices. A different set of focus. Thank you so much. Excellent. I think we're about at time. So let's thank our speakers. Thank you, guys. Thank you.